Alrighty folks, we're going to have a go at recording chapter 3 of uh, another book by R.J. Rushdeny, The Nature of the American System. So, here's the plan. We're going to hit the record and uh, get on with it, I suppose. So let's do that. Chapter 3. Alexander H. Stevens. Constitutionalism versus Centralism. Okay, and I've started badly by not giving the focus to the right one. Okay. In his day, Fisher Ames had many of the defects of the federalism of New England. Alexander Hamilton Stevens, 1812 to 1883, was associated with many causes which served to disqualify him of interest and appeal to most people today. The desire is for heroes or thinkers who make no mistakes and lose no battles. As a result, men get figureheads and compromisers. It is thus no wonder that so important an American political thinker as Stevens has suffered from neglect. He was a southerner who defended slavery, a fact which makes present-day conservatives shy away from him. However, Stevens opposed secession, and although Vice President the And although, and although, and although, and and although Vice President C of the, mm, I just what is going on with my mind? And although Vice President of the Confederacy, he has been called near treasonable in his hostility to that civil government. In many respects, he was closer in temperament to intellectuals than to politicians, but. His every opinion puts a gap between him and modern intellectuals. On those and many other counts, Stevens stands as an isolated figure. But for many reasons, Stevens is important to the United States. For one thing, his life serves to illustrate why the war was a civil war. Southerners are clearly technically correct in calling it the war between the states. Politically, it was precisely that, and it would seem clear that Stevens had the better of the argument in so terming it. Until that war ended, the United States was to a very great extent accepted on all sides as a confederation of states, and many northern leaders were of the opinion that the South was free to go. Lincoln warned of a, quote, civil war, end quote, in his first inaugural address, but the jurid juridical, but the juridical, Lincoln... Abraham Lincoln, he's stinking, Abraham Lincoln. But the juridical precedents favoured a federal rather than a national construction of the civil order. Stevens was thus right politically, but only politically. In a tragic sense, it was civil war. In many ways, Fafo. In very many ways, North and South were then characterized by a greater racial and cultural unity than the United States has since possessed. These ties were not easily broken. Except for his half-brother Linton and Robert Toombs, Stevens' closest friends had been Abraham Lincoln, who wrote confidentially to Stevens after his election to the presidency in 1860. Stevens felt called upon to battle against the Confederacy during the war for the same reasons he had fought against the Northern Black Republicans. Lincoln faced no small battle against many segments of the North, and in his own party, and whoever the powers behind his assassination were, it seems clear that they were not Southern. Both in the North and in the South, many favoured slavery and many opposed slavery. Again, in both North and South, States' rights were often opposed, a matter which caused no small controversy in the Confederacy. Thus, while politically a war between the states, it was, in a tragic sense, and in its remaining and continuing after-effects, a civil war. For Stevens, the basic issue in the Civil War was not slavery, but centralism, the steady, insistent attempt to overthrow the Constitution and to substitute for the Federal Union a national unitary state. The entire strategy of Reconstruction, he felt, 
only confirmed his analysis that slavery was but the occasion chosen for an assault on federalism. On this presupposition, Stevens wrote his great analysis of the war. A constitutional view of the late war between the states, published in 1868 and 1870 in two volumes. Stevens was a competent and experienced observer. A lawyer and a citizen of Georgia, he was a notable member of the House of Representatives, 1843 to 1859, first as a Whig, then as a Democrat. Although opposing secession, he remained loyal to Georgia and became Vice President of the Confederacy, 1861 to 1865, Head of the Confederate Mission at the Hampton Roads Conference, February 1865, where he renewed his ties with Lincoln, and then, after the war, was a prisoner from May to October 1865. A little slabbery here. He was elected as a U.S. Senator in 1866, but was refused a seat. Subsequently, he was again a congressman from 1873 to 1882 and governor of Georgia in 1883. As attorney, politician, devout Christian and a man of considerable intellectual stature, Stevens had no limited perspective from which to view events. From this vantage, his analysis of the conflict was sharply stated, quote, that the war had its origin in opposing principles which, in their action upon the conduct of men, produced the ultimate collision of arms, may be assumed as an unquestionable fact. But the opposing principles which produced these results in physical action were of a very different character from those assumed in the postulate. They lay in the organic structure of government of the states. The conflict in principle arose from different and opposing ideas as to the nature of what is known as the general government. The contest was between those who held it to be strictly federal in its character and those who maintained that it was thoroughly national. It was a strife between the principles of federation on the one side and centralism or consolidation on the other. Slavery, so-called, was but the question on which these antagonistic principles, which had been in conflict from the beginning, on divers other questions were finally brought into actual and active collision with each other on the field of battle. End quote. A little bit mushy, mushy mouth. The Constitution furthered a federal union and federal, according to Dr. Johnson and Noah Webster, then meant a league or alliance between princes or states for their mutual aid or defence. Moreover, men were citizens of the United States only as they became citizens of a particular state in the Union. In 1860, an quote, anti-constitutionalist party, end quote, came into power, dedicated to principles which, quote, if carried out, ultimately lead to the absorption of all power in the central government and end sooner or later in absolutism or despotism, end quote. The war was thus a con- Con- conflict. The war was a conflict. The war was thus a conflict of principles, a battle between constitutionalism and centralism. The men of this party, the Republicans, were quickly involved in a struggle for power. Each. Hang on a second, I made a click. Ugh. Get that. The men of this party, the Republicans, were quickly involved in the struggle for power, each seeking to exercise despotic authority. Stevens called attention to instances of this, citing, among other things, Seward's boast, quote, It was in the full exercise of this despotic power that Seward boasted, in conversation with Lord Lyons, that he could do whatever Her Majesty Queen Victoria could not do. In this conversation with the British minister, Mr. Lincoln, Secretary of State, is reported to have said, quote, I can touch a bell on my right hand and order the arrest of a citizen of Ohio. I can touch the bell again and order the arrest of a citizen of New York. Can Queen Victoria do as much? He well knew that she could not. 
and that no crowned head of Europe, not even the Tsar of Russia, could do more. End quote. In his sensitive study of Stevens, Edmund Wilson, who cannot be accused of conservatism, adds a sombre footnote to this comment by Stevens, calling attention to the modern reality. Quote, when I was reminded of the boast attributed to Robert Moses, New York Commissioner of Parks and head of the New York State Power Authority, quote, I can take your house away from you and arrest you for trespassing if you try to go back to it, end quote. Before continuing in Stevens' critique of centralism, let us examine his opinions with respect to slavery and the Negro. Stevens defended slavery without any apologies. His position was a clear one. First, the Negro is not equal to the white man, end quote. So that second, quote, subordination to the superior race, end quote, is to the Negro's advantage, and quote, is his natural and normal condition, end quote. Third, this subordination exists in slavery and is not to be condemned. Stevens' position, however, differed markedly from the stereotype of opinions usually assigned to... Produ- It's all right. Got a rhythm. It's okay. Stevens' position, however, differed markedly from the stereotype opinions usually assigned to pro-slavery men. He definitely upheld the right of any state or locality to prohibit slavery. This was, quote, not inconsistent with any provisions of the Constitution, end quote. All right. Just uh, lost focus again. He denied the rights of nullification while upholding secession, quote, as a matter of right, end quote, but opposing it in 1850 and 1860, quote, as a question of policy, end quote. Stevens believed in constitutionalism and, quote, the preservation of the Union upon the principles of that constitution, end quote, was his primary concern. He saw that the consequences of disunion and war would be far more extensive than either Northerners or Southerners recognise. The consequences would be revolution, and, quote, revolutions are much easier started than controlled, and the men who begin them, even for the best purposes and objects, seldom end them, end quote. The, quote-unquote, cornerstone of constitutionalism for Stevens was not equality, but a general, quote, principle of the subordination of the inferior to the superior, end quote. This slavery of This slavery upheld. For Stevens, slavery, while full of evils, was not itself the evil. Education denied to the slaves should be supplied, marriages fostered and recognised, and other reforms undertaken. His own status as owner of a few slaves was a good one, and their lot under him an easy one. Stevens did not see slavery as an economic fact so much as a social fact, not so much one of capital or labour, as one of superior and inferior. It was on this basis that he operated both as slave owner and thinker. Uh, It's not quite good enough, is it? It was on this basis that he operated both as slave owner and thinker. He recognised very early that the war, however it ended, would not, quote, Leave slavery as it found it, end quote. Yet the problem of the general relation of superior and inferior, and especially the racial problem of white and negro, would remain, quote. But if the principles of President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, the ultimate policy therein indicated of attempting to establish perfect political and social equality between the races, should be carried out to its final results, it would end in the extermination or the driving from the country of one or the other of the race. Okay, wow. It would end in the extermination or the driving from the country of one or the other of the races. End quote. With the abolition of slavery, he felt the wisest course was for the slaveholder to take the lead in working the 
I got too much la la la. With the abolition of slavery, he felt the wisest course was for the slaveholder to take the lead in working for the future interest of the Negro as well as his own. He wrote in his prison diary with dismay of the bloody riots in. Sorry, folks. Do it! Do it! He wrote in his prison diary with dismay of the bloody riots in Washington, D.C. between soldiers and negroes. The new order of things, by offering equality, was preparing the way for great social conflict. Quote, Sad forebodings haunt me. End quote. Equality would not work. Quote, How society is to be constituted so that all can attain justice, that is the vexed question. While I confess myself unable to see how it is to be perfectly done, I am equally well satisfied how, in some particulars, it cannot be done, for instance, by any such dogma, not well understood by its advocate, as that all members of society are equal, for this settles nothing. Equal in what? In age? Facts answer, no. In feature and appearance? Facts answer, no. In bodily size or strength? Facts answer, no. In mental strength or vigour? Facts answer no. In moral qualities? Facts answer no. In acquirements or accumulations? Facts continue to answer no. In not a single one of these particulars can any two amongst millions be found with a dogma of equality? In what then are all men by nature equal, or in what ought they to be held to be equal? Is the dogma utterly false and absurd, or is there in it a latent truth which some superficial and rash spirits, not perceiving, ignore in their misapplication, thus disguised? Go. In their misapplication, thus disgusting, ser- sincere. Thus disgusting. Thus disgusting, sincere inquirers. Thus disgusting, sincere inquirers. The dogmatist must admit that all men are not equal in any of the particulars here stated. When asked in what way they are equal or ought to be recognised as equal, one dogmatist will reply one thing and one another, hardly any two agreeing. This shows the vague ideas entertained. I like to entertain in the twilight of a time. This shows the vague ideas entertained on the subject. One will say equal in the eyes of law, another equal before the law, another equal in all pati- political, political, political right, baby. Come on. Another equal in all political rights. Another in all political and social rights. Now, that all men are not equal in the eye of the law is apparent from the fact that the law properly pronounces many persons morally disqualified for... Okay, is too much word. Too much many words. Now, that all men are not equal in the eye of the law is apparent from the fact that the law properly pronounces many persons morally disqualified for membership in society that all are not and should not be equal in political rights is apparent from the fact that some must, for the time at least, govern, administer and execute the law while the rest obey. Between these, there is no equality in political power or rights. The right to govern and punish is entirely political. It is not personal or individual. It is impossible, therefore, for all men to be recognised as having equal political rights. What is meant by social rights is too vague and uncertain to divine. End quote. Not equality, but justice should govern the political or moral order and should be the controlling principle. Stevens's definition of this justice was, in common with that of many of the theologians of his day, humanistic, 
although Stevens himself was a devout Christian who often began his day with a hymn and ended it always with Bible reading and prayer. The South was governed, Stevens held, a concern for constitutionalism, not as commonly charged by a, quote, slave oligarchy, end quote. Only in South Carolina did the slaveholders hold the political power. The anti-slavery elements in Virginia and North Carolina I take a break. Okay, back. After breathing. Okay, so let's. Uh, okay, there we go. How you all doing? What's happening? The anti slavery elements in Virginia and North Carolina were strong. And, but for outside agitation, internal forces would have abolished slavery. In general, however, the Georgia situation best describes the South, perhaps where only a minority were slaveholders. In Georgia, Stevens held, quote, It tenths would have abolished slavery, quote, If they could have seen what better they could do with the coloured people than the... If they could have seen what better they could do with the coloured people than they were doing, end quote. With the end of the war, the misrepresentation of the South began in full force. Stevens observed from prison, quote, I went to the library and got Richardson's new book, The Secret Service, The Field, The Dungeon and The Escape. I doubt the author's accuracy. I doubt if he saw a negro woman in rawhide shoes ploughing in Kentucky in February, which is too early for ploughing. Rawhide shoes I never saw anywhere. I heard that they were being used by our soldiers to some extent, being made and fitted to the foot when the hide was fresh and green, with the hair side next to the foot. How a man could see the kind of leather shoes were made of, worn by workers ploughing in a field which he was passing on a railroad train, I cannot understand. Then again, he speaks of seeing negroes ploughing and hoeing in fields near Memphis. Now, what were they hoeing? Hoeing is a business not done in cotton fields, and of such he is speaking in February. Overseers were there, armed with guns. This I never saw in all my life and in all my travels through the south. I have sometimes seen a man superintending plantations carry his gun with the view of bagging game, but never for any purpose in connection with his business as overseer. These are all small matters. These are all small matters, but my rule with a record is to judge its accuracy as a whole by accuracy on those points within my knowledge. End quote. Before the war, Stevens had tried to stem Southern fears regarding his friend Lincoln, whom he declared to be, quote, just as good, safe and sound a man as Mr. Buchanan, end quote, and one who, quote, would administer the government so far as he ended his... would administer the government so far as he is individually concerned just as safely for the South and as honestly and faithfully in every particular. End quote. The South's greatest security was in the Union, and the best security for the Union was peace. Quote, we have nothing to fear from anything so much as unnecessary changes and revolutions in governments. The institution is based on conservatism. Everything that weakens this has a tendency to weaken the institution. End quote. In spite of his respect for and confidence in Lincoln, he knew what the success of republicanism would mean to the South. In Lincoln, he knew what the success of republicanism would mean for the South. Hence, quote, my, oh, I can't do that, it's not right. Ugh. He knew what the success of republicanism would mean to the South. Hence, quote, 
My greatest desire is to defeat Lincoln and thus prevent the evils that such an event might precipitate upon us. End quote. In his speech to the Georgia legislature, November the 14th, 1860, against secession, Stevens called attention to the fact that the victorious Republicans had won an election but had not gained control of Congress. Lincoln did not share all his party's views, but assuming he did, the House had a large majority against the Republicans. Indeed, the anti-abolitionist and anti-centralist position had made notable gains in the House in northern states. In the Senate, Lincoln faced a majority of four against him. Quote, Why then, I say, should we disrupt the ties of this union when his hands are tied, when he can do nothing against us? End quote. Very many responsible Southerners shared this view. Stevens further... Hang on, was it US or us? Okay. When he can do nothing against United States, end quote. Very many responsible Southerners shared this view. Stevens further charged that, quote, sectionalism, end quote, was subverting constitutionalism, and the guilt of the South here was no less than that of the North. Whatever the provocation, quote, I give it to you as my opinion that, but for the policy of the Southern people pursued, this fearful result would not have occurred, end quote. Quote, the doctrine of the, quote, irrepressible conflict, end quote, between the institutions of the several states was, in my view, itself the embodiment of centralism. The federal government, in my judgment, so far from being weakened, was strengthened by the heterogeneous interest of the several states. Nothing tends more to the centralization of power, even in a separate state or nation, than homogeneous... Homo, homo, homogeneous... homogeneousness... homogeneousness, 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 the adornation and homogeneousness of interests on the part of its constituent elements, end quote. Here we see a basic premise of Stephen's political theory. Since a society is not... Oh, <laughs> hard work. Here we see a basic premise of Stephen's political theory. Since a society is not a final product, an end of history order, it must be a working, struggling body. To decry necessary conflict, as many in the North and South were doing, was to decry, in effect, history itself, as Stevens worded it, constitutionalism, in favour of centralism and homogeneity. Stevens knew that constitutionalism was being challenged, even as it had been challenged in the past, and would be again in the future. History means struggle. That was a weird history. History. Voiceless. History means struggle. To attempt to evade this fact of struggle by seeking a homogenous society in flight can mean... What? To attempt to evade this fact of struggle by seeking a homo homogenous society in flight can mean the necessity of repeated flight. What does that mean? What does that mean? I don't know. I simply don't know. Do you know what it means? I mean, am I being obtuse? Fala <laughs> To attempt to evade this fact of struggle by seeking a homogenous society in flight can mean the necessity of repeated flight. For Stevens, the best hope for constitutionalism and for the South was for a stand to be made in the Union. Through the conflict of ideas and parties with the confrontation of basic issues, the Union would be strengthened and greater health would ensue. But the South failed to see this and the Confederacy was born. Stevens became its vice president. It is not our purpose here to review Stevens's wartime activities. 
In the North, Lincoln assumed unconstitutional powers to suppress criticism and to further the war effort. In the South, Jefferson Davis reluctantly felt it necessary to move in the same direction, although never so far. Stevens and his friends were already severe critics of the Confederate monetary policy, opposing deficit operation in favour of heavy taxation. Moreover, according to Toombs, quote, We never had a desertion until we had conscription for the very good reason that there were thousands outside who wanted to take the places of those inside, end quote. With conscription, deterioration of morale and unwillingness to serve set in, quote, When we began to hunt up men with dogs like the Mexicans, they necessarily became as worthless as Mexicans, and every day has seen the deterioration of troops in his... Hmm? Not quite sure how to read that. Became as worthless as Mexicans, and every day has seen the deterioration of troops in as conscripts. End quote. Toombs also charged that the independent press was largely bought up and silenced. It can be freely granted that the criticisms of Stevens and Joseph E. Brown, governor of Georgia, as well as others, Georgia, Georgia, Georgia on my mind, governor of Georgia, as well as of others, were often intemperate and unfair, but their basic premise remains unexamined and these men in turn are now subjected to abuse by historians. Stevens has been accused of, quote, narrowness, pettiness, and lack of realism, end quote, by Potter. Another writer has charged Stevens in his hopes of peace and restoration to the Union with a serious responsibility for the collapse of the Confederacy. The presupposition of these usually liberal critics is best stated by Donald, quote, the collapse of a confederacy, then, came not from deficient economy. The collapse of the confederacy, then, came not from deficient economic resources, insufficient manpower, defective strategy or weak political leadership. All of these were handicaps, but none was fatal. The real weakness of the Confederacy was that the Southern people insisted upon retaining their democratic liberties in wartime. If they were fighting for freedom, they asked, why should they start abridging it? As soldiers, as critics of their government, and as voters, they stuck to their democratic individualistic rights. In the administration of the Southern Army, in the management of Southern civilian affairs, and in the conduct of Southern political life, there is, then, extensive evidence that we should write on the tombstone of the Confederacy, quote, died of democracy, end quote, end quote. This is the issue. There was no lack of willingness to sacrifice on the part of these Southerners like Stevens, except at one point they were unwilling to sacrifice their constitutional liberties. Are the modern critics right? Is it necessary in wartime for a state to become totalitarian? Is this the price of efficiency and of direction? Certainly, halfway measures such as the South took halt between two opinions and have none of the virtues of either position. But the case for liberty is not being examined, even though in World War II the success of American free enterprise in meeting the wartime demands placed upon it depended to a large degree on its successful circumvention of government controls. The black market was a major contributor to efficiency and to victory. The demands for greater wartime controls that have arisen with each war are parallel to the growing conception and use of war as revolution. Oh boy. This having become an ever-expanding function of war, it has become increasingly important to insist on the sacrifice of liberty as the foremost requirement of the art of war. Stevens was aware that war could mean revolution, and he fought the Confederacy's policies in the name of constitutionalism, the same cause he had championed in the Union. As Stevens had always made clear, his loyalty was not to the federal government nor to the South, but to the Constitution, which the South had also adopted with adaptations. 
the centralism Stevens fought in Washington, he also fought in Richmond. Again, for Stevens, centralism was the premise of the radical Republican Reconstruction, which he criticized as, quote, the monster principle of ultimate, complete centralism, end quote. The purpose of the centralists, their, quote, I'm going mad, lack of oxygen. I'll blame lack of oxygen. The purpose of the centralists, quote, their ultimate object, end quote, he saw as, quote, consolidation and empire, end quote. The Negro was a pawn in the game who would gain only a ghetto status. In prison, he hoped that the South would spike this strategy by taking the lead in Negro welfare. He suggested that Negroes be given a corporate or guild status with proportionate representation from and in each state to have a full, free and separate representation. In his sleep in prison, he dreamed of home and of instructing his ex-slaves in the meaning of liberty and woke up, quote, my eyes streaming with tears, end quote. He was horrified at the abuse of Negroes that multiplied across the country outside the South, quote, Mrs. Stowe ought to write another book. The Legrees are multiplying fast all around, end quote. He saw no hope for the South or the Union under Reconstruction. He felt that Johnson, whom he respected, was, quote, committing a great error in bringing into prominence the secession elements at the South instead of the original Union elements, end quote. As he looked to the future, Stevens was deeply troubled, quote, Gonna take a breather. Okay, breather break over. Deeply troubled. Deeply troubled. Was the quote The great vital question now is Shall the federal government be arrested in its progress and be brought back to original principles, or shall it be permitted to go on in its present tendencies and rapid strides? until it reaches complete consolidation. Depend upon it, there is no difference between consolidation and empire, no difference between centralism and imperialism. The consummation of either must necessarily end in the overthrow of liberty and the establishment of despotism. To speak of any rights as belonging to the states without the innate and unalienated sovereign power to maintain them is but to deal in the shadow of language without the substance. Nominal rights without securities are but mockeries. End quote. As Toombs wrote to Stevens, the Democrats were now in the hands of a quote, mongrel crew, end quote, I would rather worship Beelzebub than God, that... <laughs> Beelzebub than but preferred, quote, mammon to either if they could perchance reach the treasury, end quote. The Union's monetary puzzle, 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 puzzle. The Union's monetary policy was a vast swindle. With all this, Stevens sadly agreed. In 1881, two years before his death, he summarised his views thus, quote, if there is another war in this republic, it will not be sectional but social. If even the masses of the people can be made to understand our system of class legislation, taxes and finance, there will be trenchant reform or frightful revolution. End quote. The years have only underscored the relevancy of Stevens' analysis. From a very limited system of privately owned slaves, the entire United States has, from the Civil War era on, gone into debt-money slavery to the, quote, money trust, end quote, so that the fact that its very monetary wealth is debt money is itself a sign of bondage. This is electrifying stuff, I think you'll agree. All right, well, so thanks very much for listening. Um, uh, hello to those that are listening in the future, which is it, all of you, as I have already pointed out. Uh, my vast intellect has allowed me to, <laughs> to um, yeah, 
So uh, if you want to support this work, you can go to nathanteacher.com and click on the Donate button. And that would be much appreciated. Help me buy new equipment, which is more better. And uh, maybe get a, an actual working fan in here that doesn't make a brrr noise. Okay, God bless and hope to see you in the next one.